And uh, Barry, thanks for joining us this morning. Well, it's my pleasure, Travis. Thank you. Uh, you launched to the International Space Station in September of last year, and having watched it on television, you know, j- just seeing it on TV made it look like a wild ride. I can't imagine what it must have been like actually being on the Soyuz capsule. Yeah, Could you kind of describe that? Yeah, anytime you, you leave the planet, it's, it, you, as, you, <laughs> as you would imagine, it's fairly thrilling uh, with uh, the thrust as it gets uh, higher and higher and higher, the G-forces get higher, and then, of course, you have staging when all of a sudden the thrust dissipates for, significantly to the point where during stage one, I mean, it, it felt as if we lost all engines because I kind of went forward in my straps a little bit when, the, when that staging took place because you lose four-fifths of your thrust on a Soyuz uh-huh. at that point, you know, a little after two minutes into the flight. And, and then, of course, the acceleration picks up again and picks up, you know, above three, up uh, three and a half Gs. And then you have staging again for the, between the second and the third stage. And then, you know, sort of a little bit forward in your straps. And, again, the acceleration starts to uh, pick up. And it's, it's very dynamic and, and, like I said, very thrilling. And then, of course, when you get to – main engine cutoff when you're actually in space, that's a really super dynamic event on the Soyuz. It's, you know, everything shakes, there's pyros, blast firing, and all of a sudden, you know, very jarring, mm-hmm. as you might imagine as well. So, yeah, it was a, it's an e-ticket ride, as I say. How long does it take you to get to the International Space Station after you launch? Well, a couple of years ago, we started with what we would call a ground-up rendezvous. It used to, we used to take two days to phase in and, and get closer to the station. We, we'd stay in a lower orbit, which is a little faster, and we'd catch up to it, and we'd take a couple of days to do that. But now, uh, we do it in six hours. So from launch until you actually dock with the station, only six hours, and uh, it, it's, it makes for a very long day. But it's, it's much better, I think, in many respects, because the Soyuz does a – you know, when they do those couple of days, you go into what's called a solar spin, and that's to keep the thermal environment uh, uh, throughout the Soyuz kind of the same, to keep it dissipated. Mm-hmm. So you're spinning the whole time, which there's centrifugal G inside the inside the Soyuz, so that kind of throws you to the outside. And so I never did that, but I was told it was somewhat uncomfortable mm-hmm. uh, spinning for all that time. So you don't have to do that when you do the six-hour rendezvous, so that's a good thing. What uh, I imagine when you first arrived there, there's a pretty big adjustment period. You're weightless. You've got you've got to move a bunch of stuff. I'm sure. What, what takes place during that first day? Well, as soon as you get there, it's just you know you go from the very small cramp to as you again Soyuz as you would expect. You don't need to launch a whole lot of big volume to space when you're when you're just transferring people there mostly. Uh, so then you go into this big, wide, huge, open expanse of the space station. And that can be disorienting somewhat for some. I, I didn't have any transition issues at all from zero G to, I mean, from, from gravity to zero, zero gravity. So, uh, but, you know, you have a fluid shift, your body, and you have the fluids are pulled to your lower extremities of your body with gravity. Of course, you don't have that when you're in space. So the fluid shifts throughout your body. So that can be some, some uncomfortable as you get used to that just within itself. And, of course, your neurovestibular, your, your semicircular canals and your inner ear are not stimulated by gravity. And the transition to zero gravity, that usually causes some you know, disorientation somewhat. But uh, since I guess maybe because I'd been before on the space shuttle, I did not have any of that. And it was as if, as if I'd never left. So in that respect, I was very fortunate. Did, did you ever experience, I've, I've heard astronauts talk about the fact that you can, your mind can play tricks on you, especially in the shuttle, when, you're, when you go up and you're tilting backward and you start to think that you're upside down, even though there's no gravity, there's no up and down per se in space, but your mind thinks that you're upside down, and if you don't change that thought, if you don't you know, kind of do a number on yourself and flip yourself back over mentally, so to speak, you're going to think you're upside down the whole mission. You know, the, what, what that is, when you get to zero gravity, you, your tendons and your muscles and all, of course, are not affected by gravity. Pulling Your arms aren't pulled back towards the ground. So your tendons and your muscles all go to a neutral position. And if you're still strapped into your seat, you know, your body's going to this neutral position. And then all of a sudden, like I said, you're, you're, you're strapped in. So you, your body senses that you're strapped in. So since it's, it's, it's very different, especially the first time it takes place with people, it does give, can give a tumbling sensation because, like I said, it's, it's the, the difference between your muscles going to this neutral position and tendons and then being strapped in simultaneously. So you do. And I got just a moment, moment of that on the Soyuz launch. But, again, since I'd experienced it before, I just said, okay, that's not real. Turn that off. And, uh, and it did. It went away pretty quick. Kind of mind over matter, I guess. <laughs> 
Well, you literally spent hours, and, and I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of you for this. You spent hours outside the station performing uh, a spacewalk. Um, what were some of the challenges that you experienced when going EVA? And, and if I recall, Terry had some problems with his helmet. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, actually, I was very fortunate as far as the timing. It, and timing is everything and all that you do in life, I think. And uh, I was fortunate enough. Like, oh, I had four spacewalks. Uh, uh-huh. During the course of the six months I was on the space station, and I guess the first thing that I thought, you know, we we got the one man space capsule, basically what it is, shaped like a person. Of course, you get inside it; it's all self contained, and you go literally out into the vacuum of space, you know, separated by just you know thin layers of material. And the first thing that went through my mind was, I cannot believe we actually do this. <laughs> <laughs> we actually put little pink bodies and little bee suits. And send them out and, and work outside the space station. <laughs> so in that respect, it's it's pretty mind-boggling. Uh, spacewalks, you know, extravehicular activity, EVA, you, you referred to. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what we sort of the, the short term for it, EVA. Um, it, it's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, it is amazing. I mean, you sit there, you, you look 180 degrees through your visor, and you see the beauty of the Earth and contrast it with the station, and, and there's no – air particles, there's no dust in the air because there is no air, Mm -hmm. there's no humidity in the air, so the the visual is absolutely without obstruction, and it's it's amazingly clear and, and, and beautiful. I mean, it's just, just overwhelming. Uh, but but you're outside for a purpose. You're not outside the, the stargaze, so to speak. You're outside to work. And that it is. It's a, it is a great deal of work. Um, but at the same, you know, at the same time, it's it's very very rewarding when you you know you go out and you go to change things, and then they power up and they work. And uh, you know, when things go go well, of course, it's very rewarding. Especially, I would say, magnified by that environment. And uh, you mentioned Terry. Yeah, Terry's uh, suit, it got some some water in the helmet. But um, as you go back and you change pressure outside the suit, as we started to repressurize the airlock, uh, it does change some things. There's some condensate that basically built up in his suit, and it's a known issue with that suit. Mm-hmm. Some of the mechanisms within the suit itself, you know, they're they're built to the same specs, but looks like anything. You know, sometimes you get a lemon off, uh, you know, for a car, <laughs> even though other cars are built the same way. And this isn't a lemon, so to speak. It's just a characteristic of his suit. Mm-hmm. It, it has extra condensation as the repressurization process starts. And that's what, you know, was started to spit out into his helmet. So, again, it was a known issue. Uh, this suit uh, had not been used for a while. Um, we have several suits on orbit. And uh, so um, he's an ex- he was an extra large, and he that's the size he wore. And so he was in that. Like I said, it was a known issue. So when it happened, it wasn't, like, completely surprised that it happened. And, of course, assessing everything, making sure that it was that, that condensation issue. And uh, when we went through all that, we decided that, that that was indeed the case. So anyway, that's it. Speaking of Terry Verts, I remember seeing the video that you guys posted on or right around Christmas time. I was wondering if you could maybe describe what it's like spending Christmas Day on the station. I imagine it's, it's quite a bit different than, uh, than how we experienced it on the ground. And did you guys have any rituals or anything that you did to, to kind of mark the occasion? Or how did that work? Oh, sure. You know, it was uh, one thing that was really special for me. Uh, I get up early. I'm an early riser, and everybody else is uh, on. You know, they're they're probably more normal. I'm more abnormal. You know, I'd get up at 4:30. I'd work out early. So, and on days off, they would stay in bed a little longer. So, I that Christmas morning, I got up the normal time, and and uh, I had like four and a half, five hours alone. And during that time, it was it was just the timing of it all. Maybe a gift from the Lord. I don't know. But we went right over Israel Christmas morning. I was all by myself, and it was mm-hmm. the clearest day I had seen the whole time I was on, on station. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, to go over the Holy Land and, and experience that, you know, on Christmas Day was certainly very special for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as a crew, sure, we, uh, we, we treated it like Christmas. We had a Christmas tree, and you know, in zero gravity, you know, there is no up or down, left or right, as you mentioned. But still, we label the deck, we label the overhead. So our Christmas tree, we stuck uh, Velcro to the overhead, so it was up inverted with respect to how the station's <laughs> kind of labeled, kind of unique. And uh, we had all brought little gifts, and we had a little time for that. And also, you know, there were people on the ground at Mission Control Centers that had to work on Christmas Day. It's just a part of the – part. Of, and a lot of people have to work on Christmas Day, and they, they were no different. Mm-hmm. So uh, – 
since they had to do that, we uh, we actually sang them some Christmas carols from space, <laughs> just to have fun and and uh, you know make because it is a unique day, of I, course. I never saw that video. Yeah, I don't know that we took video of that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You know, it well, like matter during uh, Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Day, we had a, it was a you know a scheduled day off, and uh, we had a turkey call competition as well <laughs> that was graded by Mission Control. So. <laughs> Turkey, we tried to have some fun. A turkey call is that like, like making turkey noises or? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we all three of us gave our best turkey call. Uh, Samantha Christopher Reddy is Italian, so she had the uh, the Italian turkey, and then <laughs> <laughs> that's another I'm video Tennessee, I didn't so see. So I had the I had the backwoods Tennessee turkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, we you know I've talked to people about you know uh, what it must be like to be on the space station, and and you know as exciting as space exploration is. I, me personally, I can't imagine being cooped up anywhere for six months. Um, you know, it, were there ever any moments when when you just wanted to pull your hair out, jump in the Soyuz capsule, flip the switch, and go home? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I'm done with this. I want out. You know, uh, Travis, Trav, no, there wasn't. It uh, it is such a unique place. I mean, zero gravity it never gets old. I mean, literally, you fly around, you feel like Superman. Literally, because you you're flying, mm-hmm. um, and it's it like I said, it it just doesn't get old because it's so unique. So no, I never felt that. I don't know anybody that's. I guess there's some that have desired uh, their time, and when their time was up, they were ready to come home more than others. Um, but uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't experience that at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you were up there for six months. I imagine you probably saw a, a lot of breathtaking sights. You probably saw a lot of weather events. You you probably had a lot of experiences that that are just ex- very, very unique. Um, if you could narrow it down to one moment, what was the most inspiring moment of the trip, and how were you changed by it? You know, I, there is no way to narrow it down to one moment, <laughs> but I will give you an example of, you know, it's how, uh, what's, a, what's a good term, epic, and um, sensory overload. In one eight-hour period, I went over Baja, California, mm-hmm. which is the desert contrasted with the blue of the Pacific and the sun glint coming off of the off of the ocean. I mean, you haven't seen you haven't seen glint off of water until you've seen it off of an entire body of water over hundreds of miles, mm-hmm. at, you know, at the same time. So that was that. And then a couple hours later, it was over the Amazon mouth of the Amazon River, and then it was uh, a little bit after that, it was um, over the red clay desert of Australia. And then there was just unbelievable sights of uh, these super blue lakes mm-hmm. contrasted with the desert uh, in Uzbekistan. And that was, like I said, one eight-hour period. I took pictures of all of them. I sent them to my family, and I said, you know, this is just an example of what you can see and experience in just a very short period of time. And it is, like I said, it is, it is literally sensory overload. I mean, they never got old floating up to the window um, and just – stargazing or land gazing, you know, for hours on end when you, you know, that, that opportunity was rare, but we did have some of that on the weekends mm-hmm. and it was, uh, you know, we'd fight sometimes. Hey, let me, let me take a picture of that. <laughs> <laughs> My turn. Uh, no, I'm kidding, of course, but uh, it, it was, it was pretty amazing. Yes. Well, you came back in March, I believe. Um, I've spoken with some, some different astronauts and cosmonauts and, and I've heard some stories about Soyuz landings. Um, what was that experience like? And I, I imagine I've heard it's it's quite a bit different from the space shuttle. It is indeed. Of course, you're on your back, kind of uh, in the in this kind of a bucket type uh, <laughs> type seat. It's not a normal seat, so it encompasses your entire back, your head, you know, your hips, everything. And um, that's this was another moment where as the as we're seventeen thousand miles an hour inside the three thousand degree fireball, looking out the window, and everything is just orange um i'm thinking oh my here's another point where i can't believe we're actually do this <laughs> we put little pink bodies in a capsule and sling them back to the earth at seventeen thousand miles an hour and uh, of course the touchdown was just it was oh my it was literally you know i've heard it described as a mac truck hitting you in the back and i can imagine that's what it would feel like it was the hardest thing i have ever felt in my life you're, i mean you're falling at 22 feet per second even though you're under a parachute it's still pretty quick that you're coming down and oh my, the impact was something else. Mm-hmm. I, I've heard it said that uh, the space shuttle is is just as smooth as can be. Or, excuse me, the space shuttle is bone rattling on the way up, and just as smooth as can be on the way down. And the Soyuz is the reverse. It's it's just a smooth ride up, and 
you know, earth shattering on the way down. Well, <laughs> that's that's probably close to true. Though there were moments on the launch on the Soyuz, like I said, where it was pretty jarring just dur- during staging mm-hmm. and during main engine cutoff. But yeah, overall, it uh, it's it's fairly smooth, and the shuttle was very smooth coming back. I mean, coming through the atmosphere. Of course, we had the orange glow and all, but uh, it was uh, no hardly any shaking at all. Mm-hmm. The Soyuz does have a little bit of a sinusoidal left and right kind of a sway on launch as well mm-hmm. that I had I had heard heard about. If it it would have been unnerving had I not heard about that, uh, because you just don't expect to feel something like that on a, on a launch because you know I didn't feel it in the shuttle. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, coming back to Soyuz is probably the most dynamic of all of it, without question. Um, wrapping up here, now that you're back, um, and, and maybe looking more towards the uh, the, the days and, and weeks after you first got back, are there any any old space habits that die hard? I mean, do you sometimes forget that you're not weightless and leave a plate hanging in the air, or, or you know, try to launch? <laughs> I down have a heard, way? yeah, I have heard that some people have done that, like dropped. You know, just reached out and let go of a pan or something, and it falls to the floor. But no, I did not have that at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I came back, I've never had a sensation of, of being weightless like some I've heard have had because, you know, when you spend that much time in, in zero gravity. But no, I, maybe I'm unique in that respect. Um, I have not experienced any of that. Do you miss it? Yeah, I guess there's certain respects you miss, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a very fond of Earth <laughs> as well. <laughs> And being here and with family, I mean, the experience was fantastic. The work we did was was uh, awe-inspiring at times. Um, but here is the best place, without question. It's a great place to visit, but uh, going to space for extended periods of time, if you if you can't take your family, those you care about, you know, we're we're designed, I think, to intermingle with one another, and and you can do that with your crewmates, obviously, up there. But it's you know, being with your family is a special part. Is was there anything in particular that you craved? while you were up there any foods or any anything in particular that you really wanted you know i learned that you can eat anything if you've got enough condiments <laughs> so <laughs> i think condiment was the thing i craved there was a period where we had none uh but then a spacex came it brought up a bunch of yellow mustard and i was very happy in <laughs> <laughs> last question um I, I i this is just me you know thinking but i i, I wondered if maybe you had seen the space station from the ground since you've gotten back to me that would be strange that would that would that would be a strange feeling to have been up there for six months and then looked up and seen it fly over have you done that and what kind of emotions does that yes i have done that and i you know you see it go over you realize what's there you have a visual of what it's like that other people don't have uh, you have a visual of what the outside looks like that other people don't have, uh, other than pictures. Um, and you, you know, the people that I spent months with are still there. So in that respect, it was, it, you know, just it was the reminiscing part of it was fantastic. But and I didn't long to be back at, at this point. Um, there's a lot of other people that have that have been selected to do this job and have trained long and hard, and uh, they need to have their turn, obviously, before I get to go back. And that, and that's the way it should be. But it, it was it's neat to, it's neat to see there like I said because you can visualize all aspects of it and that's that's pretty special. All right, well we've been speaking with Butch Wilmore and Butch, thank you again for for joining us for this and uh, we we appreciate uh, all the time and 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 what you've done up there. Well, uh, my pleasure. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. All right, you too.